Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our uh, Advances in Autism Research and Care webinar. Um, we're so excited to have you. A few housekeeping reminders. If you have questions at any time, please feel free to type them into the question or chat bar uh, at the side of your screen, and we'll be able to answer any of those um, towards the end of the presentation. Um, all right, and without further ado, I'm going to welcome our network PI, Dr. Karen Kolsau, who's going to welcome our presenter for the day. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, we have a great talk coming up. I wanted to introduce Dr. Hazlitt, who is a licensed psych psychologist with a background in child neuropsychology, and her research interests are in neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, in the recent past, Dr. Hazlitt's primary research interests have focused on brain development in autism and fragile X syndrome using brain MRI scans to conduct studies of brain structure and maturation. Her work involves the use of specialized image analysis tools to examine how brain development in children with autism and related disorders compares to typical brain development. In addition to her research activities, Dr. Hazlitt participates in a multidisciplinary clinic conducting evaluations for autism spectrum disorders and co-supervises a pediatric neuropsychology clinic. Uh, so I'm delighted to have her here and look forward to hearing her talk and hearing everyone's questions. Thanks so much. Thank you, Karen. So this is Heather, and I'm uh, very honored to be invited to speak to you guys today. I know that there's often a lot of uh, different people, clinicians or uh, people in the community or family members. So um, I tried to design a talk that was sort of middle of the road, but um, as, as Karen or Megan said, we're, we are going to be taking questions and I'm happy to answer anything. And I think I have about 45 minutes um, to kind of go through some of the work that we're doing and then we'll have some time for questions. Um, so I would hopefully be able to dig into things that you guys want to ask about at the end there. So I'm just going to start, and I think, let me just check the technology. So Megan, I'm on screen share, and people can see my, um, is it slide presenter? I mean, is it just a slide, title yeah, slide right yeah. now? Yeah, I can see your current slide, and then we can also see the next slide in the on the corner. Oh, okay. So let me change it to, um, I don't know how to do, one, one second, people, and I will uh, <laughs> move that around. Um, let's do... Let's do this. I'm sorry. I actually, I think it won't let me do that. Let me try this one. Um, okay. Well, I will do this. Sorry, we just had it really big. That's probably not ideal, but does that work okay. for you guys? Yeah, that looks great. Okay. Sorry, I have multiple monitors and it's hard to know what, which monitor you guys see. So again, my name is Heather um, Hazel. I'm, the UN, I'm at UNC uh, here in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and I'm at a center that focuses on dis developmental disabilities, intellectual disabilities and other um, neurogenetic conditions, and also in the Department of Psychiatry. And I'm going to be talking today about some work that our group has done Related to studying infants at high risk for autism, they're at high risk because they have an older sibling. I'll talk a little bit more about that. And what we've been interested in doing is looking at their early brain development. And so one of the one of the first questions I'll just get out of the way is why would it be important to study early, <clears throat> early brain development in autism? And to think about that question, it's helpful to think about what had, had been done prior to the work that we focused on. Um, so First of all, there's just infant development, and we, we know that between the ages of first and three, babies, infants are just developing very rapidly, and in particular, their brains are really uh, doubling and, and tripling in size during that early developmental period. And the brain development during this period is also what's called activity dependent. So the brain is being shaped and scaffolded with sort of the experiences that the infant is encountering in their day-to-day -day life. And so th that helps the brain develop connections and grow. And um, this is also called, some people call this or consider this a critical period for development because you can alter or sh alter the shape of the, the brain growth trajectory by um, sort of exposures or um, having limited exposures to certain 
um, enriched environment. So it's a very important time, and it's a very rapid uh, brain period of brain growth, and so it makes it a very good time to study brain development because you'll you'll be sure to capture a lot of changes in that period of time. And this is just a little image by one of the collaborators that we work with here at UNC who studies typical to brain development. And you can see sort of going from left to right, um, two different kind of images, top and bottom. But basically, you can see just how different an infant, this is a, a two-week-old infant, then again at one week, one year, and then at two years of age, and how more um, refined those gray and white matter tissues are, are showing up, and that's because the brain is really forming all these connections and growing and maturing very rapidly during that period of time, the first two years of life. And this is just another image that shows kind of from the cortex, looking outside in, the surface of the brain, um, kind of a complicated image, but really the main idea is that there's a whole lot of change, particularly in the areas that are kind of red, so those are what's called the temporal lobe, where a lot of language um, connections happen, but across the whole brain, um, gray matter is growing in the first year of life over 100%. And you can see the same sort of pattern in the second year of life, to a lesser degree, um, about 18% increase over the first year, but you can imagine in that first year and then in the second year, the brain is just still rapidly growing and the cortex is expanding and those neurons and connections are, are, are becoming more and more complex. Inside the brain, um, the connections that I'm talking about are described as white matter. So these are large fiber tracts or um, the myelination of neurons that's happening. And this is a picture of the corpus callosum, which is really just a central large fiber bundle. And you can see, again, from two weeks of age, an infinite one, and then, again, an adult. This isn't the same individual, obviously, but um, just how rich and comp uh, complicated that white matter development becomes um, compared to an infant that's born and then an adult walking around. And you can see that there's just a whole lot of growth that's happening, both in gray matter and now here, again, in white matter. And Going back, just to think about what had been uh, known about autism and brain growth, this was a nice paper that was put out by David Amaral's group um, several years ago now, but it was a nice survey or overview of the studies that had been done. And to this, to this, at this date, the studies were primarily cross-sectional, which meant they took a group of kids and compared them to another group of kids. A couple of the studies were longitudinal, but for the most part, the studies were cross-sectional, and, and you can see sort of the pattern that people that were studying children that were very young, so maybe um, five-ish, the brains uh, were very different, larger, than compared to typically developing five-year-olds, and that that difference sort of uh, dwindled down, became less evident as you approached adulthood and went into um, the older ages, th over 30. And so that, again, this is not longitudinal data, but it just showed this pattern that certainly during early development, people were finding rapid uh, overgrowth in the brain. We had a study that was longitudinal, but it started at age two, where we looked at children who were two, and then we brought them back when they were between four and five. And you can see that in red, the children uh, with autism, and these children were diagnosed from the community with autism, and we, we verified their diagnosis um, when we brought them into the clinic, compared to children who were t typically developing, and that typically developing group was actually enriched for some children that had developmental disability but did not have autism, but even at age two, their brains were larger than the control group that we had, and what we one of these things where we had hoped actually to capture a change between two and four, and that was really our intention, was that we were going to hopefully see some big growth or, or, or aberrant trajectory in brain growth happening between two and four in those children with autism or the group with autism. But what you can see from the slide is that we missed it. They are already different. They were already grown uh, and were larger in comparison to the control group, and that if it was happening, it was happening before two. And so this led us to think that we needed to study children younger than two. 
And for those of you that are in clinics or um, working with families, you know that those children are, are out there, but they might be kind of hard to find. And so it led us to think about ways that we might be able to find these children. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that later it's related to our study design. We were not the only group that saw some differences in brain growth. There was another group, again, uh, David Admiral's lab, that published a group that was pretty large size. It was 115 boys, um, and they had megalencephaly, which just means they had greater than 98th percentile head circumference. Um, and they scanned them at age three and found that those uh, children that were in the ASD group had greater surface area. Um, and so this was kind of encouraging because in science we always like it when people corroborate and, and find similar findings to what you also find to know that it's more than just an effect in your own group or, or study. So <clears throat> the study that was designed based on this idea that we wanted to find children um, younger than two uh, created this network. So we had um, a under the leadership of Joseph Piven, who's at UNC, an Autism Center of Excellence funded, and we called it the Infant Brain Imaging Study. And this was an NIH-funded study that was um, funded to have us look for children at high risk for autism, and they, they were at high risk because they had an older sibling with autism. And so these were families that, that were recruited because they had a child with autism, and then they had a baby. Um, and so the children that were the babies were the infants that were in our study. And the, they were considered at risk, but obviously as infants we didn't know what was going to happen to them. We needed to follow them as they developed and grew. But we did capture their brain growth and their development in, in our clinics. Um, but the study that we did was all across the U.S. And so, for example, I'm down here at North Carolina, but... You guys are in Boston, and any family that was in the Boston area would have been um, sent to the Children's Hospital in Philadelphia, because CHOP was one of our sites where we were able to see families. And then we had a couple of others on the other side of the country, so University of Washington and Washington University in St. Louis. And families were reimbursed to travel to our sites. Um, they spent a couple of days at our centers, and we all were coordinated to do the exact same assessments and the exact same scan. So it took a lot of people, but um, we were able to gather a lot of data this way. And the hypothesis that kind of led us to this, this design of the study were these two things. One um, was some work by Lonnie Zwagenbaum, who's a, who's a pediatrician in, um, he's in Alberta right now, but he's in Canada. But he had, he had done a lot of work on infant behavior and early risk markers for autism, and he and some, uh, had worked with this data called the AOC, which is sort of like a, similar to the ADOS, for those of you that are familiar with that instrument, and what he observed was that um, when you looked across from six months to um, about a year and a half, the children with autism were um, showing sort of no difference at six, but then they were declining around 12 months of age with some of their... Um, behaviors, or not declining, but emerging with some of their behaviors that were on the autism spectrum. And what that indicated to us was that definitely there were these behavioral changes happening different from typically developing in the children with autism in those first couple of years of life, beginning as early as six months when he first measured it. And then we had a study that looked at just head circumference, just measuring around the head and looking at head, head size growth. And we found a similar trajectory that around 12 months, we saw a increase in the in the children who were, um, this was a retrospective study, so they had autism and we were able to collect their medical record data, but we knew they had autism. Around 12 months of age was when we started to see this split, that there was kind of a larger head size observed from that point forward. So these two ideas led us to think about this high-risk design. And again, this network was created. It was funded by NIH, so it was an Autism Center of Excellence, and we were interested in finding these infants at high risk. The genetic um, predisposition in those families is, is um, slightly different depending on the paper that you read, but it's a, roughly 20%. So for example, if you had a child with autism, then the subsequent child, the younger child, would be at about a 20% risk to have also a diagnosis of autism as they grew, grew a little older. Um, 
So they were considered high risk. We saw them multiple times in, in their first couple of years of life. We had uh, initial study at 6, 12, and 24 months of age, but we added some addition with uh, some new funding, additional time points. So I don't have it on the screen, but basically we were able to see some children even um, four times. So we might see them at three months or nine months in addition to some of these other time points like 12 and 24. And then we were able to follow a large proportion of them up at, at 36 months. In all of our centers, there were four of the clinical centers, did the same exact behavioral and developmental assessment and the exact same MRI scanning assessment. And we collected with the MRI data a way to look at the gray matter, so the white matter and the, and the gray matter tissue um, was what we were able to measure from those types of images. Uh, we also collected a very special uh, image called DTI that allows you to look at white matter specifically. And then we we did something called functional connectivity that lets you look at, it's, it's what people do when they're doing fMRI, but obviously babies are not able to do tasks in the scanner, so they're called um, resting state MRI or functional connectivity because you can look at the connections, but they're not doing anything in the scan. And we published, oh, I should say, um, I'll go back to the screen for a minute. So I should say that all of the centers did all of their scans without sedation. And so this is no small task. Um, most of the centers were scanning at research um, MRI facilities. And so that probably helped because if, if any of you have gone to an MRI suite or center, you know that they're pretty noisy, bustling places. And so these infants were being brought in often in the nap time part of their day after they've been doing some of these developmental assessments and hopefully getting tired out, um, or in the evenings. Um, we sort of were flexible and worked with the families to see what might work best for them and their child as far as the, the best chance for success. Sometimes we had to bring them in more than once. So if they were visiting us from another state, um, they would be spending the night at our, at our site, at our location for a couple of nights, and they would maybe try first time, and if it didn't work, they would come back in the next night, something like that. Um, the families are really accommodating and, and flexible and helpful with us as far as that goes. So most of the um, centers were pretty successful. The success rate was very good, and we were able to collect a lot of data, so we were really happy about that. But it is difficult. Um, we published this data last year, and it was uh, a, had a big splash at the time. Infant brain, I mean, early brain development in, auto, in infants at high risk for autism spectrum disorder, and it's one of those things where a lot of time and effort has gone into make like one paper, but that's that was our longitudinal data. Um, you can see here the sample that we ended up with. So we ended up with about 248 infants who were in the high risk group but did not go on to have autism. We had 70 infants in that group, the high-risk group, who did go on to have autism, and about 117 children in what we would we would call our low-risk group. Um, they were in families with no family history for autism, and they were considered typically developing. And then they met they they uh, did not meet any criteria as we assessed them for developmental delays or things like that. The um, samples were pretty well matched, but you can see the high-risk sample that ended up with autism did end up with more males. Over 80% of that sample were, of that group were male. Um, you can see that otherwise the samples were pretty well matched for maternal age at birth. So when they had these babies, um, the birth weight of the babies, even the gestational age, about 38, 39 weeks. And then you can see that for this particular data set, we were reporting on the longitudinal data when they came at 6, 12, and 24 months of age. And we did with them a, a lot of things, but um, here on this table, what I'm showing you is basically the Mullen or the uh, Mullen early scales, early developmental scales, and, and this is sort of their global estimate and a Vineland or an adaptive behavior measure, usually reported by the mother. And what you'll notice is that for the high risk infants who didn't go on to have autism, they were looking very similar to the control group, the low risk group, and the children with autism were looking. Um, much lower, and there was there's a range of those, but they were significantly different than the other two groups in their cognitive ability or developmental ability and their adaptive functioning. They were lower, both of those. And this is sort of a graph of what we observed. So what we saw in the children with uh, autism who were on the spectrum at 
age 24 months are in red, and then the green are the high-risk infants who did not go on to have autism, and the blue are the low-risk infants, um, you can see really the trajectory veers off somewhere around that, you know, six-month of age time period um, between that and the 12-month the period where we saw them again for their uh, just brain overgrowth. And this is just a global measure volume of their brain, the total brain size between 6, 12, and 24 months. And you can see that that trajectory actually, if you think back to the slide that we showed about um, head circumference, it looks very similar to that actually. We, we um, see a very uh, slight increase around 12 months and then it continues on from there. We wanted to see if the brain differences would be associated with the behavioral features because um, if you recall that the, the collaborator uh, Lonnie Zwagenbaum who was publishing on those early behavioral risk markers part of our network and so we were able to think about these questions um, we tried to associate that total brain growth with their autism severity score. So we looked at the, the ADOS severity score and their growth rate, and what we saw were, was that there was really no association between those two things for the period of time between 6 and 12 months of age. But there was a relationship between 12 and 24 months of age. So in the first year, the score didn't really correlate with the brain growth change. But it definitely did in the second year, and, and so we, what we were seeing was both an emergence of the brain volume overgrowth, but also the behavioral symptoms that we were seeing. And they were primarily the social affective items on the ADOS, and not so much the repetitive behavior items. We actually, in our battery, um, used the ADOS to help us think about their outcome at age 24 months and again at 36 months. So we didn't want to use the um, exact same instrument that we chose to help us think about their outcome to also do this brain behavior relationship. So we wanted to um, double check ourselves and we used an instrument called the CSBS um, that is, very, is somewhat similar to the ADOS, it's a little bit more structured than the ADOS as far as how it's, the tasks and, and activities are presented. But we were happy to see the very same thing with that data. So we saw that the social deficits at 24 months were related, just like with the ADOS severity score, social affective items to rapid or increased brain growth in that second year of life. We also wanted to measure that just cortical size, and this is called surface area, and if you think about the brain and how it's got grooves and ridges, um, the sulcal patterns of the, of the cortex, you can actually measure that and sort of get a, an estimate of what is the surface area. And what we found was that, again, similar to the brain volume, the surface area was rapidly expanding as well in the infants that went on to have autism. And it was not like that for the children that were high risk but did not go on to have autism or the controls. And we tried to localize where those surface area uh, regions were most expanding. And you can see here in kind of yellow and red some of the uh, regions we had some idea that we might be able to correlate those regions with behavior that might be associated with those, that, that area of the brain. Um, but what we, we didn't want to kind of over-interpret our data. So what we could see from some of these regions is that they're, they're sort of visual, some of them are kind of visual sensory types of areas, which are consistent with some of the behaviors that you would think about related to autism. But we wanted to think about whether this surface area expansion or overexpansion could be a biomarker. Everybody these days are very, very interested in trying to think about biomarkers and whether things could be a predictor. And so we had such a strong effect for surface area and we saw this early expansion sort of preceding some of these behaviors that we were interested in that we wanted to try and see if surface area might be a good predictor. We had a couple of um, colleagues who were computer scientists and they were able to use what's called machine learning and, and really this, this slide is a little complicated but basically um, they took just the brain data I mean they they were really just using the surface area at six months the surface area at 12 months what was the sex of the child um, what was the total brain volume and that's it we didn't tell them the outcome we didn't tell them anything else and they did a lot of different um, 
combinations of the data. So they basically did what's called a tenfold analysis where they pick out 10 cases and they try it and they pick it out or 10 percent of the cases they pick it out again and they do that over and over again and the result of what they did when you do it that way is um, you are able to come up with what's called a, a prediction um, and the positive prediction for the test for those children who they say by using their algorithm would be in the autism group was about 80 percent consistent with what we see with the outcome that they actually were. So if they were in the autism group, this machine out learning algorithm, this sort of computerized algorithm, could predict with about 80% accuracy those children that ended up on the spectrum just using the brain data at 6 and 12 months for the surface area. So that was pretty exciting um, because it does suggest that this could be a biomarker, possibly, um, if you were able to get this type of data. It's actually something um, that's even more suggestive than the behavioral rating scales that exist currently. So right now there's a, a, a first-year inventory um, that's out there that parents can fill out. They published a positive prediction value, and it's about 0.14. Um, and then there are also um, some predictions that are pulling from behavioral data. This is um, Kasha, uh, Kasha's work at uh, Yale, where they're looking at 18 months for a later prediction. And they get about 0.5. So again, these brain data are telling us something that's uh, a little bit more strong of a, a signal than some of the brain, I mean, the behavioral data that, that's been published, at least um, with these high-risk infants so far. And so what we've kind of conceptualized is that as far as the timing and what we're observing, we see this early expansion in surface area happening in the 6 to 12 period, 6 months to 12 month period. Then we see this l expansion or overgrowth of the brain volume. And in that same time period, we're seeing these behavioral features emerging that are characterizing or classifying kids on the spectrum. And we are kind of thinking about this as sort of a cascade of ha things happening with brain development and, and that maybe some of these brain growth differences are, are putting people on a different path and that that's what's contributing to some of these behavioral differences. These are all just our hypotheses. Again, we're, we're hoping to study this and, and learn more about it. Um, but it gives us certain clues to the mechanism that might be uh, investigated. So, for example, um, there's a nice paper put out by Alan Packer um, about how does the cortex grow and the neurogenesis of the cortex. And what we know is that there can be alterations in how the neurons, these early, early cells that later become neurons, how they proliferate. And perhaps with autism, there's an over-proliferation of these, these neurons, these early progenitor cells. And that that might be something that has a role, and at least in some people with autism, and that we actually know that there are some genes that influence those cells developing. So it gives us lots of things to investigate further as far as what could be the mechanism and uh, how it might at work, because it sort of points to this timing, this very early stage when we know some of these cells in the brain are developing in this way. And so we do have other evidence that there might be some early brain differences, not just coming from this one paper, or this one work. We have a uh, we had a postdoc who's actually uh, stayed on and is now on faculty at UNC, Mark Shen. And when he was uh, at Mind at the Mind Institute, he published a paper that was on their sample. They had a, a smaller sample, but it was a similar sample of infants who were at high risk for autism, and they had um, brain overgrowth. And what they found, if you can see on the red kind of part of the brain, their brain overgrowth was related to what's called uh, extraaxial fluid. So they were able to measure basically the CSF in the, in the outskirts of the brain or, or surrounding the brain and see that it was overgrown or there was too much, there was more of it compared to kids that were typically developing. And he was able, when he was here with us, um, work on the IBIS data set and essentially replicate his finding from that smaller sample at the MIND Institute with the much larger IBIS data. 
Um, so our, our sample is much larger, and what he found was exactly the same finding. So that was really nice. Again, it's always good when things are replicated and, and you can show them in different samples and in different times. And this, the infants in our study, in our IBIS study, he used um, the procedure looking extraaxial fluid and found that those children who went on to have autism also, um, similar to his earlier work, were showing this elevated extraaxial fluid even by six months. And so you can see in red the children that were high risk for autism that ended up on the spectrum compared to the controls or those that were high risk that didn't have autism in blue and purple. And it's, it's pretty striking. Um, it, was a, it was a little bit smaller than our other data, but it's still a very impressive finding. We um, tried to use some prediction to see if that extra axial fluid could also predict outcome and come up with about a 70% prediction. So it's, it's telling us also that um, kids that have enlarged overgrowth of this extra axial fluid um, at six months also by about 70% certainty are predicting um, they're going to be on the spectrum for autism. We had um, another postdoc who was able to dig into the functional connectivity data. So this is that sequence that's similar to fMRI, but the infants are just in there. They're just sleeping. They're not doing anything. But you can still see networks of brain activity from that data. And so he took the network of brain activity at six months, and you can see sort of top left-hand side there, and it's called functional connectivity. And he was able to correlate, and it's, it was a very small sample because I will say that the functional connectivity scans are at the very end of our protocol. So first they do all the um, structural scans, then they do the DTI imaging, and then they do the resting state. And for any of you that work with it, babies, you'll know that if they're going to sleep, they're, 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 they're going to wake up when they want to wake up. And so often they would wake up towards the end of our protocol. So we had much less of our data for this particular question. But using this uh, functional connectivity functional connectivity data and the network pattern that it had, uh, that it displayed, he could predict with about um, a little over 80% accuracy those infants just at six months using this functional connectivity data who ended up on the spectrum at two. So that was also um, very encouraging because what we're seeing from a lot of different methodologies but still thinking about the brain, lots of indicators that there's something going on in the very first year of life that can help us indicate or predict those children who would later end up on the spectrum. So <clears throat> it's, it's an encouraging work. We had another colleague who's now, he was at UNC and now he's at the University of Minnesota, Jason Wolf. He, he did um, something with the DTI data. So if you remember, the DTI data is a sequence that really illuminates or really is, is specialized to pull out white matter. And what he was able to do was look at the neural circuitry, so taking the DTI data at six months and thinking about, he's very interested in repetitive behavior and sensory behaviors. And so he took the DTI data at six months and found that it was associated with more repetitive behaviors and more sensory sensitivities at 24 months of age. And it could uh, predict as well, um, there's a strong association those children at six months with these aberrant white matter tracts that he selected, and the fact that they had more or greater repetitive or sensory behaviors at 24 months. And he used that mostly from parent questionnaires. That was the RBSR and the SEQ that he used. <coughs> and so just to summarize, sorry, um, what we were observing with this brain data was that we see these differences in the brain um, as early as six months of age. So the cortical features, we also see um, the, these white matter tract differences, the extraaxial fluid, the functional connectivity maps. Um, we also see that there's a change over time. So it's not static, that the brain changes in, in the children that later fall on the spectrum are preceding that, the behavioral characteristics and that it's, um, related. These differences are, are associated or predict later outcome um, by, you know, roughly 80%, depending on which of those measures you want to um, think about. So, of course, the question that we always get is whether or not 
we can have um, an answer to the you know outcome question. I think we have a lot more work to do. So we have a lot of data, and we've been taking these slivers of different types of data. So we've been looking at the brain structure, and we've been looking at the brain function. But we have so much data that we actually think we could add some of that together and have an even better predictor or better model for thinking about outcome. And so we're actually working on doing that right now where we're combining basically the uh, most strong brain findings that we have together to see if the, the prediction could be even improved over what we've seen with using just one. Um, we also know that every child is not the same, and so we have to be thinking in a more individualized way. And so we're also hoping to look at some of the brain behavior data in a more individualized way. And so perhaps, for example, the children that have, you know, these rapid expansions in surface area um, may or may not always have the same behavioral profile. Maybe some of them may look like they have more communication or language difficulties, whereas others may look like they have more repetitive or sensory behaviors. These are just um, ideas. Um, but these are things that we can explore by looking at individual profiles and thinking about all the different ways the data might work together. So if you have a big brain, but also your white matter trajectory is growing off course, does that lead to a different, slightly different outcome than a child that maybe doesn't have those two things, but just one? And then along the way, we've been adding lots of things to our data set. So we have had the benefit of getting a lot of funding to study these children because there is such a rare opportunity to follow and watch these children develop. And so along the way, we've added some additional types of data. So we've added genetic data. Um, so we've been doing genome-wide screening on these children. And then also we've been collecting a lot of data about environment. So we, we are also wanting to think or look about environmental exposures or maybe different types of environmental possible exposures that people are exploring. Like people have started to think about exposure to metals or air pollution or different things like that. And so we've been collecting data that will help us think about environmental exposures because it could be that, you know, the timing of brain development could also interact with genetics, or it could be influenced by genetics, or maybe some of the genes are turned off and on by different things in the environment. It becomes a very complicated picture when you think about all the different ways things can work together. So it, um, we have such a rich sample and, and such a um, great community of families that have been helping us with this work that we've been wanting to make the data as just as rich and thorough as possible. So probably the question that I get asked the most, and I just figured I'd ask it myself, is do we have a biomarker? Because that's always the first question that I get. Um, so probably the answer is no, um, not quite yet. Obviously, this is work that we're doing um, now. We've done it. We've published a lot of it, but we would like to replicate it. So we want to know that it's not just some quirk in the way that we've approached this particular data. We would like to really replicate this with a, a fresh set of data so that we know for sure um, that what we're seeing is really something that we can replicate and see um, regardless of what sample it is. It's, it's a um, phenomenon that we're capturing, not just a quirk of the data. And to do that, we need a, a fresh set of babies. And so we're trying to get some funding to look at a fresh set of babies so that we can do this replication because we think that um, I mean, certainly other groups would be able to do this as well, but we feel obligated to try to do it ourselves. So we are trying to replicate this um, finding. And then we also are trying to think about ways to make this cost effective to roll out for community use um, or, or just to be more practical. Because the way it is now, we are, you know, collecting this data in these research centers um, we have teams of people that are really pretty good at getting these babies to sleep during an MRI scan. And that's not something that just anyone anywhere might be able to do if they had an infant show up in their clinic. And so what we're hoping to do with maybe some of the investigations that I just mentioned earlier about thinking about genetic or maybe thinking about ways to um, kind of figure out sort of ultra high risk. So it's possible we could think about a way to um, 
not just use the brain data, but think about the, ch the children and what their history might be in such a way. So they're coming from a high-risk family, but perhaps this or that has also happened, and that those children would be the ones that you would then want to send through what would be considered a more complicated or expensive, um, you know, pipeline or process to think about early outcome predictors. Um, because it, right now it's something that wouldn't be feasible just for every clinician, every pediatrician's office to implement like it is right now. And so I think that that's sort of where we are. We are hoping to think about ways to maybe figure out children that are at ultra high risk so that we know, um, you know, if we have these predictors that work, but yet they're costly or difficult to acquire, that we could um, route them, you know, if they're if they've got more than one risk factor toward that versus have every child be screened in this way. We, we get that question a lot and um, people ask us, you know, is everyone, do they need to get an MRI? And, and I think that it's just the science in the field isn't there yet. But certainly we are feeling very encouraged and promised by the fact that there's a lot of converging evidence that something is happening with brain development in that first year of life that we can capture, at least with our measurements, and it does give us clues and, and, help, and help point to children who will fall or, or with fair certainty are going to fall on the spectrum. And so with that, I'm going to just um, close and say that this is a very large group of people. These are just some of them that uh, were at a meeting recently, um, all across from these different universities, and we've been working together for, you know, um, two cycles of this project, we actually are just now starting to see these children at school age. And so that's been really, really exciting because um, the children, you know, and these families are willing to come back. And we're thinking actually that the uh, children in the high risk group that don't go on to have autism may actually be at risk for other things besides autism. So they may have more of a risk for ADHD or anxiety or learning problems. And so we are wanting to not just only think about autism, but think about some of these other risks that these families are, are also struggling with with their, their, their younger siblings. And my last, oh, if I, that might be my last slide. I think it is. Oh. So I'm going to, I thought I had a thing about our funding, but I don't see it. So I will just stop there. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Hazlitt. That was um, so great to hear about all the interesting work you're doing. Um, we did get a few questions, so uh, I'll just read the first one and then um, sure. we'll see how many we can get through. So um, the first question is, in terms of functional connectivity, did you find more hypo or hyper connectivity with the functional MRI data? Also, which brain network stood out in terms of structural or functional differences? So the functional connectivity data, um, they were able, they mapped the data in different networks. So for people that do this type of work, they are thinking about things like the default network, for example, sort of like your base sort of operating network. And they did, the uh, what Robert did didn't really um, focus on looking at the different networks per se. Um, he, but it was sort of an overconnect. I guess if you had to pick between hyper or hypo connectivity, um, sort of a different pattern, I guess, and the strength of the connections were a little stronger between certain nodes which are in the network. <coughs> and then I can't rem remember what the second part of the question was in the structural co data. Um, did we see? Yeah, yeah. The question was um, which brain networks stood out in terms of structural, structural or functional differences? Okay, so for the structural data, um, that wasn't a network analysis, but it did. we did look at that, that surface data. And like I said, the regions that we found, um, you know, were associated a lot with sensory or visual. So there were some regions that were very near occipital lobe, which is a very visual-oriented part of your cortex. Um, and some sensory motor areas were kind of prominent. Um, so we were, we were kind of struck with that because some of the earlier work, and I didn't show this, but we have an investigator at the University of Washington in the Estes who published on just the behavioral data from this, this sample. 
And so what she did was took the mul she took the Mullen data from 6, 12, and 24 months to see sort of what were those early developmental trajectories looking like. She included other data in that paper as well, but what what was evident was that some of the earliest data, developmental data, that showed problems in the children that later went on to have autism were motor. And so some of the motor items from the Mullen were the things that were showing the, you know, kind of coming up as sort of the low points or, you know, difficult areas for the children that later went on to have autism. So that was a separate investigation, but was similar to what we were seeing with the brain regions, where it was kind of these motor sensory areas that seemed to be different. Hopefully that answered the question. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, Another question we got was, um, were these changes that you recorded the same um, within boys and girls, and were they like of the same degree, or did you see any gender biases going on? Well, that's a good question. We have someone who's looking at some gender differences in, in um, some of the data, but if you um, if you remember, we had um, we we recruited our sample to be pretty well matched, males and females. So we had about equal numbers of boys and girls entering into the study. And remember, they were entering as infants, and we didn't know what would happen with them as, as they were developing. But at the end, we had the autism group predominantly male. And so we weren't able to look at the gender differences in that group yet. We've collected more data since then, so we will be looking at this. But we... We had sort of an um, unbalanced sample in the autism, in the group that, went, the high-risk kids that went on to have autism because so many of that group were male compared to female. So we didn't feel confident just pulling out the females and looking at the boys versus male versus female in that group. But we are going to. Um, we have also a large number of high-risk infants who did not go on to have autism. And so we're able to look at some things a little better, but obviously that's not our whole sample, um, but we we are definitely thinking about looking at that. We just weren't able to split it up quite yet because we didn't have enough girls in the autism group. Great. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, one more question was, uh, could you speak a little more about the environmental work that you're um, planning on starting on? Sure. So two of these things have already started. Um, one of the things, um, we have an investigator at Johns Hopkins, she's in epidemiology, and she has recently, she's gotten some funding to look at um, air, air pollution. And so it's actually kind of an, I didn't know much about this before she started working on it, um, but apparently um, because they are able to um, map things back in time, what we have to collect from our sample are zip codes. And so we collect zip codes of the families and where they lived sort of during the um, kind of pregnancy time period and, in, and then into early development. And um, through some of the records that um, are kept, they have um, sort of mapped what, what sort of toxins are, you know, what air pollution you've been exposed to in certain regions based on zip code. Which is, I think, fascinating and, and sort of alarming. At one, I can't believe they keep track of all that stuff. But um, but it's a really interesting way to be able to collect it because it's not invasive to the family. You know, it's not like we have to test the child again or draw blood. But um, they're able to to map out this data and and also chronologically think about it as far as you know exposure in prenatal versus postnatal. So that's one thing, thinking about air pollution. The other is the metals exposure. And right now, um, the two assays that they are focusing on are lead and manganese. But the way that they are collecting that data, and again, this is not my specialty, but we have colleagues that are um, able to capture metal exposure, the history of it from shed baby teeth. So when, the, when your child grows and their teeth fall out, they have a method to Basically, this is my <laughs> very limited, you know, ability to describe this work. Uh, basically, cut into the tooth, and this is the analogy that I use for my own self, but think about it like rings in a tree. But basically, they are able to see with these metal assays 
the exposure to the metals and when those exposures took place based on just a shed tooth, so a, a tooth that's fallen out. So we are currently in the process of collecting the teeth. Um, our babies have now, you know, grown, and so their teeth are falling out, and um, that's something that we haven't gotten the data on that yet, but we are collecting that. We also collect genetic data th through um, salivary DNA samples, and then if families are willing, blood DNA. Um, and there's an investigator that's very interested in also thinking about um, growing IPSC cells, so getting cells to differentiate and grow. And um, so those are some of the things that we're working on right now. We are also hoping to get some additional funding. Apparently the, metal, the metals assays are very expensive, and so we're trying to get some additional funding to look at additional metals besides just lead and manganese. Great. Um, thank you so much. So I think that kind of wraps up the questions I've seen. If anyone has any questions um, that didn't get addressed, feel free to type them in now, or you can also send an email to me, um, and I can reach out to Dr. Hazlitt and see if we can get an answer for you. Um, yeah, I'm so happy that you guys were able to bear with me and listen after lunch. Um, <laughs> it's hard to talk. I was just saying this to Karen ahead of time. It's hard to talk to nobody because you can't tell if people are like totally bored. But um, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, I wasn't totally boring and it was interesting. No, it was it was great. We really appreciate it. I loved hearing about all the amazing work you're doing, and I'm really excited to kind of see where all of this leads, uh, especially some of that environmental work you just spoke of. That all sounds really fascinating, and like it'll produce some really great insights. Um, so yeah. I want to thank you so much, Dr. Hazlitt, thank and you, thank everyone Megan. for joining. Yeah, of course. Um, and reminder to everyone, this is um, – being recorded and we'll be able to put this up on our network YouTube page. So if you know a colleague or someone who wasn't able to attend, you can always direct them there and they'll be able to kind of watch um, the presentation for today. So thank you so much, everyone, and especially thank you to Dr. Hazlitt. Thanks, Megan. All right, everyone, you. I'm going to go ahead. Thank you. Yeah. And Megan, can I ask you, should I just do I just close out of my thing? Yeah, yep. Yeah. You'll close out and I can close out and we'll end the webinar for everyone. All right, bye everyone. closing out. Thank you.